everyone. <laughs> Don't steal my line. Welcome, Hi. welcome. We are so excited to see all of your beautiful faces for the Charbay 40th anniversary Sip Scout party. We are very excited to have a featured maker here with us today. Marco, give everyone a wave. Marco hey, Kevick is here. He is the master distiller, co-owner, all things Charbay. Um, maybe if we get lucky, his wife Jenny and the co-owner will be popping in to say hi. We'll see. She has a lot going on, but um, yeah. So welcome. And Larissa, if you could keep admitting people as they get in, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Suzanne. I'm the founder of the Crafty Cast, where we are all about celebrating and supporting craft alcohol makers like the wonderful Charvet Distillery. And my name is Evan. I am a certified sommelier, a certified cider professional, uh, whiskey enthusiast, equal your, opportunity craft beer drinker. Uh, I don't know. He's your craft booze professional. So <laughs> we are certainly here to talk about all things Charvet and spirits today. If you have any other burning questions, feel free to message him in the chat and he can help you out with things like that and all the other boozy categories. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before to our monthly Sip Scout party, welcome. We are thrilled that you're here. Um, we do this every month. You got your Sip Scout kit this month. And you know we send these out each month. Next month is a cider kit, a craft cider that has a palm fruit variety. So there's one apple, one pear, one quince, and one blend. And then July is a mystery month where we're going to take you to another country, kind of transport you to another country with a mystery month. Um, let's see, August is a rum tasting rum, with some cocktail cocktails in there and too. rum tasting component yeah, like yeah. together there. Oktoberfest beers uh -huh. come up and then I think it's American single malt, which is an exciting kind of new burgeoning category. The American single malt category will be later in the fall. So all crap. All the time. All the things <laughs> that you want to have on your grocery store shelf, but unfortunately can't always find. We are happy to deliver it for you on a monthly basis. Absolutely. So thank you for being here. For those of you who this is your first Sip Scout kit, I do want to do just a little apology and sorry. If your Sip Scout kit wasn't so beautiful when you opened it, that is not our standard. This is what it should have looked like when you opened it. We had a little supplier issue with our bottles. Your bottles were a little bigger than our inserts allowed for. Um, and so they got a little messy in transit, and we're so sorry about that. We hate that our, our box wasn't perfect this time, um, but we think you're going to enjoy it and love this. The contents yeah. overshadow the presentation by a far shot. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Charvet has been a favorite of ours, honestly, since almost the founding of the Crafty Cask. Um, Maybe before. In full transparency, Charvet was one of our very first clients. Um, Jenny found us, and reached out to us to help with marketing and other fun things and events and stuff like that and some video photography. Um, and so they were one of our very first clients and we have been longtime fans ever since. And I remember pouring Charbet's vodkas, which were very early on the scene in my recollection with regard to flavored vodkas when I was just beginning to bartend in the early 2000s. Or at least flavored vodkas that weren't artificially delicious flavored vodkas. Yeah. Naturally flavored and I was vodkas. like, what, green tea vodka? Yeah, yeah. And it tastes like green tea? Yeah. So we have a lot of a lot of memories with Charbet. We love this brand a lot. We only support brands that we really love. That is something you always can know about us. Yep. Um, so yeah, with that, thank you for joining. What we're going to do for the first half hour or so is... We're going to talk with Marco and we're going to kind of let, learn all about Charbet. For those of you who are new to Charbet, um, we're going to learn all about Charbet, hear a little bit about their story. And then Marco is going to walk us through our tasting, tell you a little bit about each spirit. And then once we do that the whole time, please feel free to put questions in the chat, converse with us, with us in the chat. Evan and I will be keeping an eye on it. If there's anything we need to voice over to Marco to make sure he answers it or sees it, we'll do that as well. Um, but for the first half hour or so, we are going to ask that everyone stay on mute just so we can kind of get the content out there and make sure everyone's sipping and tasting everything. And then after that, we're going to say, feel free to unmute yourselves, chime in, talk with Marco. We know some of you are friends. You know him personally, so feel free to do that. You'll get an opportunity to rub elbows with the, the distiller himself and, and talk to him directly. Sound good? Any questions from anyone before we jump in? All Just right, let's rock and roll. Let's do this. Marco, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about Charbet. 
Yeah. Well, th first of all, Jenny says hello. Um, we, uh, Ivan, our our youngest son, has a soft of a machine pitch baseball game right now, so they won't be able to come in, unfortunately. But Jenny's like, say hi to everybody for me, please. I'm like, yeah, I totally will. <laughs> But uh, hello, everybody. My name is Marko Karakashvich, and uh, we're in the middle of Charbet Distillery right here. Um, this right behind me is a new still. Woohoo! Brand new. Yeah. And then this one over here is our still that I learned on uh, and still use today. Um, it's a Prulo pot still from Cognac, France. And 40 years ago, my mom and dad bought it brand new and had it brought in from Cognac and installed. And Robert Prulo himself, the owner of Prulo pot stills, came over just to make sure that everything was dialed in. I mean, it was really cool. And uh, my first job was actually inside that pot. Uh, I would uh, sit on a bucket and I was cleaning overhead dripping TSP back in the day. And uh, that was my first job. I was 10 and uh, 40 years later, uh, here I am, here we are. And we're, uh, we're adding another still uh, 40 years later. This one's, this one's made in Canada and uh, it holds uh, 2,200 gallons. And so to combined, you know, we'll, we'll distill the first run in this one and then finish in that one. And it's going to be awesome. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting it all figured out and uh, installed. It was uh, daunting, but now I'm past the daunting. I'm ready to let it rip. So <laughs> it's Well, cool. and Marco, tell us a little bit about, because um, I know the original still that you had is a very kind of artisan still that requires you to really be very hands-on with it and really kind of like, you can't, like, don't you sleep at the distillery when you're doing stripping runs and all that? Or not stripping runs, when you're doing runs? Yeah, I mean, when I'm when we distill, I use uh, I get a tanker of beer uh, from a brewery to make whiskey, and it takes ten days, twenty four hours a day. Uh, I do sleep in this place, uh, and uh, it uh, it's a whole nother it's a whole nother lifestyle doing that. But so will uh, this new still be a little bit more? You can kind of set it and leave it a little bit more than the old still, or is it still going to require that super intense? hands-on focus. This one, um, this one's going to take about 12 hours to do one run. So we're only going to work 12 hours a day. And then, only, uh, only. Yeah, well, you know, and then once, once we get, once we get one run done, it'll produce 600 gallons of hearts and then we'll put the hearts in the Prulo still. And then that'll be running. So pretty soon we'll have both running at the same time. And then we can just do one shift a day uh, and it should take about, you know, four days, five days at the most to double distill a tanker, 6,400 gallons of beer and make 600 gallons of whiskey out of a tanker instead of uh, like 10 to 14 days, 24 hours a day. So cool. it's, yeah, it's totally exciting. And, you know, uh, there might be, uh, there might be a way to make a little gin with that still too. Oh, you guys don't have a gin yet. That's exciting. Exciting. Yeah, yeah cool. Uh, and there's a couple other products that we're working on that uh, the world hasn't done before. Uh, so we're, you know, we're, we're, we're picking the pace up even more right now. This is our 40th anniversary this year. And uh, mom and dad are retired there. Uh, they live in Mexico sometimes and they live on Spring Mountain sometimes. And, uh, you know, Jenny and I are, going full throttle with it. We like that you're not yeah. sitting on your laurels on your 40th anniversary, but in ra rather you're like, you're picking it up. <laughs> so go. like, how do we, what do we do next to turn the page and continue to reinvent and re-describe what Charbet could mean? That's really beautiful. Yeah, you know, it's it's exciting uh, working with uh, working with breweries. We uh, we have the opportunity now to work with another brewery that uh, can, can produce even other beers for us uh, to, uh, to label, enable us to make California bourbon, double pot distilled, 100% uh, rye, double pot distilled, and then also uh, California single malts. Uh, we've been doing those for uh, years and haven't, uh, haven't released any yet, just barrel aging away. 
Cool. So, That's great. Cool, yeah. Cool. One of the things we love about Charvet is they've kind of always been ahead of their time. Um, there are some products that they've even released in the past that, you know, or maybe, or maybe is that like sun choke? Didn't you do a sun choke liqueur or something like that at one point that yeah. nowadays that might go crazy because people are always looking for these really unique ingredients. The flavored vodkas, like we said, one of the first natural flavored vodkas, yeah. distilling whiskey from finished beer, right? So you guys are always kind of on the cutting edge and it's exciting to see where you're going to go from here for the next 40 years. Yeah, I hope my boys uh, stick around because there's plenty to do. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, let's try let's get, something. What are we going to try first? Yeah, let's jump into the tasting. I was just going to say the same thing, Marco. Let's start with the Meyer lemon vodka. Um, yeah. and we can do a, you know, let's go from light to more complex. I think that's what we talked about there. And yeah. I'm going to raise this glass, even though we're not going to drink the green tea one, yep. one yet, just to say cheers. Cheers, everyone. Cheers to Charbet. Happy, happy 40th, 40th anniversary. Yeah, happy This is 40th. really exciting for us to host you and be involved with your, you know, yeah. culmination of, yeah. of four decades of amazing work. And we're delighted to be here. Thank you, Marco, for yeah. being here. Yeah, and cheers to all of you for coming and celebrating with us. Yeah, thanks for having me on Crafty, too. This is awesome. Yeah, of course. So, Meyer yeah. Lemon Vodka. Um, we... Uh, we kind of went backwards in the in the industry. Everyone usually started out with a clear vodka, straight vodka, and then add introduced flavored vodkas to their line. Um, you know, I was I was 21 and uh, watching what people were drinking, and a lot of people. In, you know, I was living in Napa Valley, and a lot of people were drinking a lot of wine, and a lot of people were drinking vodka if they weren't drinking wine. So I said, I asked my dad, I'm like, hey, you know, let's make some vodka too. Why not? And my dad's an artist of flavor didn't want to make clear vodka because uh, vodka had zero flavor in it whatsoever in his mind. And so, um, no, okay. And then I look on the shelf at this one restaurant and there's, there's absolute citron and stoli orange. And that was it back in, in the, in the mid nineties. And we were making a Meyer lemon extract. We were taking fresh Meyer lemon at the time. We were making a Meyer lemon extract out of fresh picked Meyer lemons, pulling the color and flavor out of the skins, the fruit, the juice, the oils, the pith, the whole fruit, uh, taking that extract. And my dad wanted to make a Meyer lemon limoncello, like a Meyer lemon liqueur. What? And, you know, it, it would be great. But I mean, who's drinking liqueurs back then? And it just so... I'm like, hmm, well, let's see. You know, you don't like vodka because it has no flavor in it. We have this beautiful, beautiful Meyer lemon extract that we just made out of fresh picked Meyer lemons. Uh, let's, uh, let's put some, let's make, let's make Meyer lemon flavored vodka. And that way you can't tell me that our vodka doesn't have flavor in it anymore. So uh, that was in uh, the first release of that Meyer lemon vodka was in 98. So two... 25 years ago. Wow. Happy 25th, Meyer Lemon. <laughs> 25 vintages. And we can only make it one time a year because the Meyer Lemons in California are ripe um, in January, February. Um, there's, a, there's a beautiful area in uh, like central California towards the Sequoias. It's about 100,000 acres of citrus, about 1,700 feet up in elevation. And uh, that's where we get our Meyer Lemons and our blood oranges as well. We make blood orange vodka as well. And you know, that's one of the real distinctions between craft and kind of what I affectionately call big booze um, <laughs> um, is, you know, like Marco drawing a line in the sand and saying the best Meyer lemons are only this season, only this time of year. Therefore we can only make it when we get them versus being like, well, let's use other lemons. Let's figure out like something else. We've got to keep making them, you know? And I, we love that. We love that dedication to like quality ingredients because you know, delicious in is delicious out, as you like to say, Marco. So, and that's true. You know, it, it's stressful because, you know, at the, at the end of the sales cycle of every, every year, we, we, we make the call how much we're going to make. We don't ever want to run out, but we don't want to oversupply as well. Sure. So we make enough, we make enough to anticipate sales growth, hopefully. Uh, and then, you know, right, right at the end, right around December, right after the big push on December and January, we have like maybe three or four pallets left. And by then the great, the Meyer lemons are coming in time to make another extract uh, and then integrate into our vodka and then, uh, and then bottle and, and get the next batch out. So, but cool. uh, yeah, and it's been great. 
Yeah, I love that. And so sipping vodka straight isn't necessarily what a lot of people do. Some people love vodka on the rocks, you know, um, or vodka straight. But if if you're taking a sip of this and this is feeling a little like, whoa, you know, as, as with all of these, you know, you can always kind of add a drop of water. You can add an ice cube. What are some cocktails you like to do with the Meyer lemon, Marco? Well, so lately I've just been putting it on the rocks and drinking it with really good soda water or sparkling mineral water. Lovely. Uh, so clean it's so easy to do it's super refreshing uh you know I, i'm not doing too many crazy cocktails with it but uh this one time jenny and i were on a cruise ship and we were the we were the vodka experts on for holland america and uh, we were taking off from mexico i forget what port we were leaving but we were having a big party on the back deck and we were pouring our rum and we we're making uh pina coladas and we ran ran out of our Tahitian vanilla bean rum. And I know I had like 17 cases of Meyer lemon left. I'm like, get the Meyer lemon vodka and put it in and make a Meyer lemon pina colada. I think that's called a uh -huh. chichi. And oh my God, uh, swapping, uh, swapping, Meyer, uh, swapping rum out and replacing it with Meyer lemon vodka and a pina colada is awesome. Yeah, that yeah, sounds that like sounds great. it would be just incredibly vibrant especially as i'm sitting oh. here we're sitting here sipping on this meyer lemon well you're adding you're adding essential oils of the fruit i mean you're adding acidity to a to a pina colada i mean it's just a it, it's, it's a good way to go um yeah and and you know i feel like we definitely kind of reflect on your uh your notion of not making anything that's too complex and overt because the delicacy and like the precision and the flavor profile of your base spirit, you don't want to cover up too much. Yeah. And so even a pina colada, like I would be a little bit reticent, but if it's real oh, yeah. pineapple yeah. juice yeah. and if it's real yeah. coconut milk, yeah, that sounds so good. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good, man. Um, it was uh that was uh that was a fun night. <laughs> Sounds like it. Marco, you're making Eric Huber nostalgic. He says, just talking about the vanilla rum is bringing back good memories. Bring it back. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. It's time. I mean, that's uh, that I've been I've been thinking a lot uh, lately about rum. And uh, I think uh, pretty soon it's time to time to make some more because and it's just it's just tasty and it's good all year round. I mean, it's not as far as sales go and 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 everything is products and different types of spirits rum kind of doesn't really have the the full force pressure of of being consumed you know 24 7 every single day like some other spirits do but that's okay um you know it's uh, it's it's got its place in time and so it and I, I like making it too. It's fun. So, yeah. but the problem is we can't, we don't have any, we don't have any sugar cane from Maui like we did in 05. So we got to find some, we got to find another tropical island that's making some sugar cane for us. <laughs> yeah. We're trying to help the rum out in that area. We're always at the Crafty Cask. We always say like, move over whiskey. Rum is the next big dark spirit because people, people think of rum and they think of like rum and Cokes or like super sweet tropical drinks. Captain but like Morgan. rum when it is made well is yeah. gorgeous. Especially like if you like slightly like bourbon, like I feel like bourbon drinkers like would love craft rums if they yeah. sipped on them. Like, that whiskey. transition is so easy for a drinker to make, yeah. in our opinion, for sure. But we digress. Yeah. Let's move over to the green tea vodka so we can open this up yep. and let people start talking to Marco. 100%. And don't feel like you have to finish your first one before we move to the second one. We're just going to kind of taste through them and then we can come back and... Yeah, we're not trying to... Uh, no pressure. <laughs> ...provoke yeah. alcohol abuse here with like... Yeah. So green tea... Off. Uh, green tea vodka. First, you know, in 98, we launched Meyer Lemon Blood Orange and then Texas Rio Star Ruby Red Grapefruit, which we're bringing back again uh, this year. Making All a special right. Yeah, it's super juicy. It's super intense. Yeah, uh, good. I've, been wanting, I've been wanting to make it for a long time. And we also made key lime vodka back in the day, but I think we over extracted and made it really too intense. And so uh, we dropped the key lime vodka and then in its place, um, we found another thing that we really like, which is green tea. And we made, uh, we, we sourced our teas from China, first growth tea, not white tea, but first growth teas. And then uh, we made an extract out of those. So we pulled the color and flavor out of the, out of the tea 
And then we integrated that into our vodka and made green tea flavored vodka. And the first time we released that was in 05. And there was no other tea flavored vodka um, on the market. And uh, th again, this one, I mean, on the rocks with soda water is just the way to go. Uh, but uh, I, I met a friend, James Lee in Colorado, who was working at a, a, a Mexican taqueria cantina, and he made a um, PIMS cup with mm. the green tea vodka, 50-50 with PIMS and green tea vodka, and then the rest of the, the, the ingredients for a PIMS cup. And it's one of those cocktails where you try it, and you're like, I, I need to order another one right now, please. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pitcher class uh, cocktailing for sure. I mean, it's so good. Um, the green tea, plus, you know, when you, when you extract green tea with alcohol and water, uh, the way we do it, um, caffeine is alcohol soluble. So we pull the caffeine out of the tea leaves and, uh, it's, it's in the bottle, you know, it's not like, you're not going to want to clean the house or anything, but it's a good chatty buzz for sure. And, uh, I love the green tea. I mean, God, we've been doing that for almost 20 years now, like 18 years. Marco, I love that idea of using that in a PIMS cup because I do feel yeah. like one of the cool things about a PIMS cup is that it's kind of like a fruit salad and a dinner salad <laughs> like in a glass. And one thing that can be missing is a little bit more of those like herbaceous or like root herb driven kind of flavors that green tea just kind of lifts up into that. Like, yeah. supports all the other kind of elements of a PIMS cup, especially when you add the fresh ingredients that should be there, in my opinion. We have, we have some PIMS, so maybe afterwards. That <laughs> sounds so cool. And we have PIMS, and we're going to make one of those very soon. Oh, man, it is, uh, it is so good. You know, I mean, PIMS, uh, PIMS cups, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, Negronis, I started drinking Negronis a, a while ago and uh, we were substituting some blood orange vodka for, for gin because you add orange bitters to, to a Negroni. I'm like, well, well, pop the gin, take the bitters out, pop the gin out and put blood orange vodka in and make a, and make a blood orange com, uh, with Campari and, and Punta Mes, uh mix and make okay. a... Uh, and uh, so I've been I've been doing Negronis for a long time, and I I I don't know, but I, I you know I I could see Pim's cups coming back, um, you know, pretty you know, it might take a while, but you know no one ever no one ever thought Negroni would explode and have Negroni bars and have 17 different styles of Negronis to try on airplanes and, and cruise ships and stuff like that. I mean, it just never happened. So, um, you know, the, I mean, from my experience for, for like the entirety of the time that I've spent behind the bar, I've been trying to encourage people to drink rosé wine and everybody still had a bad taste in their mouth from white Zinfandel. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden it was something rosé happened. All day. Yeah. So yeah, I feel like it's like fashion too. I feel like cocktails come and they go and then they come back. Like I feel like espresso martinis having a renaissance right now, you know? Sure. It's been a um, oh, oh you mean you mean stuff like this? Oh, oh. what's that? What's oh. that, Marco? Oh, ho, ho, ho. Is that dark chocolatey looking, coffee looking, liqueur looking thing? Yeah. Is that a sneak peek into something you're working on? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Um, who doesn't like coffee? And who doesn't like coffee liqueurs? And who doesn't like really good coffee liqueurs? Uh, you know, so uh -huh. we're, uh, I've been, I've been formulating and doing trials and, uh, testing it on my wife. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun and, uh, we're going to be launching our Charbet espresso liqueur here pretty soon. That's exciting. Yeah, it is. Cool. Takes like four minutes for it to turn on too. It's uh, it's no joke. <laughs> nice, nice. Quick ingestion, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's cool. So speaking of special special treats, yeah. this this third one, the tequila. Y'all aren't ready for this. You're not like. You got to tell us the story, Marco. You got to tell us like the master of uh, the piece and the, you know, give us, give us the background. 
Yeah, that one, that's a that's a pretty tasty Blanco right there. Uh, actually, uh, it's been sold out for what, like a decade? And oh. pretty tasty is an understatement, please. Well, let's see. We we made it in late 08 down in Arandas at La Altena, home of Tequila Tapatio. Um, and then we aged it in stainless for like a year. And then we bottled it and launched it in 2010. So it was pretty much gone 2010. So yeah, 13 years ago or something, it was come and gone. We were supposed to get like 2,200 cases in the container. Uh, but only 1,800 showed up, and later, you know, Carlos tells me, "Oh, I have, I have my stash of Charvet Blanco." I'm like, "Oh, Carlos!" And uh, we, the whole story is, uh, you know, my, we, we love tequila too, and I met Carlos Camarena uh, at uh, Jimmy's Tequila Bar over in Aspen during uh, Aspen Food and Wine. We, we think it was 2002, maybe. We don't really remember, but it's right around there. And we started talking, uh, we started talking about, you know, what grandpa used to do because he's third generation distilling family and we're multi-generational distilling family. And uh, it was just really, it was really fun to talk with Carlos. And by then it was like two o'clock in the morning and, you know, everything was, everything was working. And uh, then we started talking about methanol and because methanol is an alcohol that you have to be uh, aware of when you're distilling tequila. And then Carlos would say, well, you know, methanol doesn't come out in the heads. It comes out in the tails. I'm like, oh my God, this is so wrong. You know, it's like methanol is a smaller molecule uh, than ethanol. It should come out in the heads and not the tails. And he's like, you don't know tequila, Marco. It's a different animal. I'm like, oh my God. Well, I, you know, by then, now it's like four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, man, great talking with you, Carlos. I, I, I hear you. I just, man, I just have a hard time with this. But uh, you know, and and anyways, we became good friends, and he invited us down to make our own tequila and watch the GC every five minutes when the, when the as the distill came off the still of a, a double distillation of a blue agave and sure enough you know nothing 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 and then all of a sudden like you know like the third quarter of the run just a monster spike of methanol shot out in the tails and he's like see i told you the methanol comes out in the tails and my dad's freaking out because he's a chemist and he's like this is not right uh and um, nobody really knows for real, you know, why the methanol is coming out in the tails and not in the heads when it's a smaller molecule and smaller molecules vaporize at lower temperatures, which is the beginning of the run, not the end of the run. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we, got to, we got to do whatever we wanted to at La Latina. Carlos, uh, Carlos allowed us to uh, change up some fermentations and uh, make our own cuts and do our own thing. And we got to, we got to make this Blanco um, back in 2008, and uh, David uh, David OG from KNL, he does an annual report of tequilas. And uh, in 2010, when we launched it, he uh, he's like, I don't know what's going on. I got a fundamental problem with this. But uh, you know, the 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 2010 tequila of the year with KNL is Charbet Tequila Blanco, made by Miles and Marco, two distillers from California. Uh, and uh, so we crushed it. And uh, it was super fun. And my, and then, so after that, I sold out, you know, for sure. And then I told Carlos, I called him and I was like, Hey, you know, let's make some more. He's like, well, you know, the agave prices are going up and, uh, you know, by up means like six pesos a kilo. And that was a lot more than what I paid. And I was like, Oh man, I wouldn't be able to, you know, put a Blanco out for like under $85. And I just said, forget it. Uh, I'm going to focus on making stuff at home. And, uh, but what turned out after that was tequila tapatio, uh, was never brought, was never in the United States. Um, they had a, uh, he had a contract with, uh, Jim Beam Global, uh, you know, uh, forcing it to only be El Tesoro coming out of La Tena, uh, until 2010. And I'm like, hey, you know, I've got my license. I got my importer's license. I have distribution lined up. Let's just take care of New York and California. And then all of a sudden, you know, blew up to uh, 40 states. And uh, so we we get to import tequila tapatio for the whole U.S. 
um, uh, straight from La Altania. And I, I love smelling the Charbet tequila and tasting it because you can smell and taste it. And as it opens up, you get different flavors of cooked agave, fresh agave, fermentations, the distillations. You smell, you can smell the different parts of the distillery, uh, La Otenia, in the glass when you're trying the tequila from Charbet or, or tequila Tapatio. And uh, it's just, uh, I mean, two of my favorite things are being in Mexico and distilling. And so when I get to do both at the same time, I mean, it's golden. It's just, it's cool. And um, that's really cool. rare. There aren't many distillers in the United States who can say they've distilled like all the different source materials to like really do this, including sugarcane. Sugarcane is another one that a lot of American craft distillers have not worked with that. Um, so it's, you know, a, an accolade for sure that Marco can say, I've worked with agave, I've distilled, you know, tequila, like that's pretty rare. And if you distill something from agave or agave um, syrup or something like that here in the United States, you legally cannot call that tequila. You have to call that agave distillate or agave spirit. Um, yeah. And so you'll start, you're starting to see more and more of that here in the United States. There are a few places who do good ones. Um, you know, yeah. we certainly know of a few, um, but honestly it's confusing to consumers, you know, like, so when you go to the store and you're looking at things and you want to buy a tequila and you see something that says agave spirit, you're wondering like, is that going to taste the same as tequila? Is that tequila? I don't know. And then often people pass over it. Um, yes, so to be able to or, actually call this a tequila is, is huge. South Africa, they're producing agave spirits. Australia is producing agave spirits. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's catching on, you know, it's the youngest spirit category, you know, that we have, it's only been around for like, what, 250 years, maybe 300 at the very most. Um, so it's uh, relatively new uh, to the world of, uh, of the different classes of spirits, but uh, it's definitely, you know, it's definitely running full throttle right now. Uh, the, it, the, it's a blast. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked that we get to have tequila tapatio for the whole U.S. and uh, the Charbet tequila. When Jenny is like, Jenny's like, oh, we're gonna do a crafty cast. We need something special. We need something really special. I'm like, oh, well, I mean, you're like, I know what you're asking about. We are blessed. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. We do have some tequila left. I mean, my dad put a skull and crossbones on this last palette of uh, Charbet tequila blanco. It was like absolutely nobody touched this, and uh, so I did ask him, and we. We poached a case out of there. Uh, yeah, from the private reserve, you guys. This is nowhere, not available on the market, but at the from end of the session. Stash. Yeah, but I am going to put a link in the chat at the end of the session. It's going to be erased, everyone. Are you ready? We have like seven bottles of each of these that we're tasting tonight, ready to go in online order. Um, so you can maybe, if you're fast enough, get your hands on one of these bo leftover bottles of tequila, which... Wow. Easy to get. Yeah, I know. We have a few left. We, we asked you for a few more than we needed so people could go get a full size, a full size bottle. And just as a sidebar, before we move on to the next spirit, I wanted to step back and talk briefly about something that Marco touched on there, which was the increase in the price of agave that might have prevented him from making tequila again. Um, with the important concept as it pertains to the crafty cask and why craft is important yeah. that tequila to an extent and mezcal certainly are maybe the last of the artisanal spirits left in the world. Everything else is made from source material that can be made from a commodity where you and can grown just- grown rapidly. Grown rapidly yeah. every year there's a, there, there's a harvest. Agave is not that way. Blue Weber agave, which is required to make tequila, comes to maturation somewhere in seven to 10 years, there are some agaves that take 30 years to mature. And the proliferation and the, uh, I guess, recognition of these spirits and the popularity of them is being importantly uh, protected by the people that care in Mexico. And buying tequila or tequila mixto or anything that really isn't a true craft spirit, especially in this category, is kind of pillaging a really important resource. And that's something that we feel very strongly about and we hope that you do too. 
and often taking advantage of a local population Very um, so. and really, you know, so with tequila in particular, with everything we believe drink craft, you know, do your, do your homework, but with tequila in particular, please don't buy $20 bottle. Please don't buy the Jose Cuervos <laughs> of the world and stuff like that. Um, you're, you're doing, doing Mexico a disservice. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I just, uh, I just hope that they don't clear cut all the the thirty year old uh, special rare species of agave that are growing, and it takes them thirty years to grow. But uh, are you have you been replanting them for thirty years while you harvest that thirty year old? You know, that's the problem mm -hmm. I, I have with mezcal, is uh, you know, yeah, you're finding these really uh, amazing uh, uh, varieties uh, of agave, but you know, if you're commercially harvesting, you got to be commercially planting. Um, you know, for, you know, sure. your whole life. I mean, 30 years, geez, you know, you better have been started at least 15 years ago. And people I, I don't really, I mean, maybe, maybe 10 years ago, people started replanting uh, the more of the wild uh, species, uh, varieties of agave for, uh, for mezcals. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy what's going on down there. So we, before we move on to the, the whiskeys and the brown spirits and our other very, very special one, although they're all very special, um, we do have one question about um, from Steve. Since it's distilled in northern Mexico, isn't it Bacanora? Um, and there's, there's some confusion sometimes, I think, and I'm not sure if it's related to this, about it only being able to be Jalisco and like there's actually broader regions now and all that. Yeah, so this was distilled in... This was distilled in, in Jalisco, not in Sonora, correct, Marco? This was at this was yeah. this was distilled in uh, in La Latina Distillery. It's it's in Arandas. It's in Jalisco. Uh, it is the same still uh, distillery that they've been using since 1939 uh, to make tequila tapatio, and El Tesoro came on the market as well. Uh, Ocho started uh, uh, in La Altena, and Carlos just recently uh, started Los Alambiques Distillery uh, on the other side of Arandas, um, maybe maybe like 20 minutes away. Uh, but uh, he has his own uh, distillery for Ocho exclusively now. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was it was distilled in Jalisco at La Altena Distillery. And and Steve, just to clarify, yes. In northern Mexico, in Sonora, uh, mezcal distillate that is found and produced there, which I think only became legal in the late 90s, is referred to as Bacanora. Um, and I think that it might only be in Sonora. There might be adjoining states on the Mexican border where Bacanora is also produced. But that's probably one of the more obscure agave-based distillates from Mexico. Uh, and it does come from northern Mexico. Everyone, I'm pinning, I'm pinning Tom and Steph here. They made a, a fun little cocktail, and they're saying that they are using their Charbet glasses they got at the distillery back in 2005 oh, for, for their cocktail. So we have some longtime Charbet fans here. Thank you for joining and showing us that. Love it. On. That's awesome. Nice. All right, are we ready for the? Are we ready for the whiskey? We're moving away from the white spirits. Oh, you know, just one more thing about our Blanco. If you get one of those bottles, we have the GPS coordinates of the ranch that our agave oh, came from. Yeah. We put the GPS identification of the uh, of the exact location of those agaves right there. It's just a small like to our camera. Uh, I don't know if the focus is going to work this close. Little triangle, uh, triangle, little patch of agave. Um, so. Something kind of cool right there. <laughs> well, let's move on. Let's go to D and T, right? Is that where we're going? Yes, we're gonna do D and T next. And for those of you who've been fans, Suzanne's of doing crafty, a happy dance right now. <laughs> for those of you who've been fans of the Crafty Cast for a while, you know, whenever anyone asks me what my favorite anything is, my answer is always like, I have no favorite children. There's, but when it comes to whiskey, I'm like, well, there's one whiskey that's lived in my special decanter, and it's the only whiskey that lives in my special decanter for a very long time, and it's this one. Um, and from the very first time I discovered it, this has been my favorite whiskey. And I keep looking for one to beat it out, Marco, and I just haven't found one yet. She's um, diligent about looking, too. I am. I am. Um, so, Marco, tell us about this. This was kind of related to your, like, thesis almost with your dad when you were taking over kind of distilling. Well, yeah. I mean, my, my family's been distilling since 1751 back in Europe. 
and my dad came over and my mom and dad uh, met in Michigan and then they came to California and in 83 they started Charbet. The definition of master distiller in, in my family uh, has been always been the ability to meet and exceed your instructor, uh, make something, uh, you know, make something as good or better than the person who taught you. And it could be a relative uh, or, you know, for uncle, grandma, somebody, whoever, whoever was uh, running the still in that generation. So for me, it was, I've been working with my dad since I was 10. And so I, uh, and he's like, and you got to launch something in the market that the family has never released before. I'm like, okay. Well, sounds like whiskey to me. Cause I just had, I had this, I had, you know, I had this, uh, fascination with American whiskey. Um, I, I started brewing beer in high school and learning that the two row malted barley, that I used was the same two row malted barley that they use in, in distilleries to make whiskey. I was like, well, 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 I made this tasty Pilsner, Czech style Pilsner with saws hops and tasty beer. It's by 8% alcohol. It's two row malted barley. It's 8% alcohol. It's, you know, uh, I think we could distill this and make whiskey out of it. Right. And my dad's like, that's not American whiskey at all. I'm like, oh, fuck. Okay. Well, no, well, but that was in the eighties. So then in the, uh, in the nineties, uh, we got the opportunity to actually get 22,000 gallons of Czech style Pilsner, a true lager, uh, lager to like 38 degrees for three months. It's just delicious beer. And my dad and I were here 24 hours a day, 10 days, you know, actually that was three and a half weeks straight um double distilling that and we we distilled that czech style pilsner beer and put it in the barrel and then two years later we released it as a uh, hop flavored whiskey that's the category ttb put us in and so it was the first uh, pilsner beer distillate uh, on the market and it's delicious because it's concentrated you know when you distill delicious you concentrate delicious and so that's a marco for, isn't everyone yeah it is <laughs> It's just reality. And, uh, yeah, so I was like, okay, so I want to, I want to be thirteenth generation master distiller. So I, uh, I had the opportunity to buy some, uh, some IPA beer from a, from a Boonville brewery, and uh, then uh, just double distilled it. I aged it in stainless because I wanted to, I wanted to showcase off my talents of being a distiller, showing off that still. Uh, that's still right there and then and then showing off the spirit so i didn't even put my whiskey in a barrel i wanted to, i wanted to make an eau de vie in the form of whiskey um some people call it uh, moonshine some people call it other things uh but uh i i aged it for five years in stainless and just let all the flavors integrate and then um i'm made my own label and got it all approved and bought the glass and started selling D and T doubled and twisted whiskey, clear whiskey in 2010. And, um, I, there was the first year that, uh, Paul Picoult had his, uh, ultimate spirits challenge over in New York. It's a really, it's really amazing. Uh, it's an amazing competition spirits competition. And uh, Doubled and Twisted took the highest rating of all whiskeys, brown or clear. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool, you know? And I told my dad, I'm like, hey, just got the highest numbers in, in, uh, at the Ultimate Spirit. She's like, I know it's good. I'm like, hey, 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 I'm just telling you somebody else likes it, dad. You know, Jesus Christ, you know, take it easy. And uh, but after that, he's like, congratulations, you're a goddamn master distiller. Let's drink some, smoke cigars. I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me like uh, 26 years to earn the title of 13th generation master distiller and uh, just been running solid ever since and you know just uh, just banging away the rest so, is history as they say <laughs> the ENT yeah. is like my uh, liquid thesis and this is uh, what are you this is a uh, lot number two right yeah I think so yeah we're sold out um pretty much if not like maybe a couple cases left or something like that but uh, we're we're gonna 
I've been, Jenny's been hammering on me to, uh, you know, make the, make the next blend of D and T. And so what, what the D and T is that you're tasting is a blend of three different whiskeys that we've barrel aged all separately. So it's our straight malt whiskey, two roast, it's a single malt whiskey, double distilled. And then uh, it's 2011 Big Bear Black Stout from Bear Public Brewery. So we take delicious beer and double distill it and age it in French oak, take that whiskey and age it in French oak. Um, and then there's uh, also Czech Pilsner from 2015. So we took five barrels of single malt, three barrels of Czech Pilsner and two barrels of stout and blended them all together, made a 10 barrel blend and uh, diluted it down to uh, uh, 90 proof. And then, uh, and that's the D and T. And the and term glorious, it's all over the place. Flavor complex, you uh, know, you know, it's just, there's so, I mean, it's, it's kind of bizarre. Uh, there's so much flavors. There's so many different flavors from so many different, I mean, just the stout alone has six different roasted and toasted barley malts. The, the, the Czech Pilsner has got the saws hops, the straight malt is right there. I use French oak. I use American oak. I use new barrels. I use old barrels, uh, in this blend. So it's, it's, uh, it's cool and uh it's so only, a, only a 10 barrel blend thank you yeah the the chocolatey notes are what always really like get me a little bit and i'm not even a huge chocolate like person necessarily but for whatever reason in this those chocolatey notes just like, grab me and i love making an old-fashioned with this with brown sugar instead of white sugar and oh, using um mole bitters and oh. it's just like mind-blowingly delicious it's my favorite hey marco uh can you talk a little bit about the namesake of Double and Twisted? Because oh, yeah. I feel like it harkens back to another thing that the crafty cast feels strongly about, which is something that is craft is not something that you can just push a button and then wait for the distilling run to end just based on, it. you know, some kind of readout of a chemical Number. spectrometry. Yeah. The art. Yeah. Of it. yeah. Well, uh, Double and Twisted is an old liquor term for you're drinking the good stuff because back in the day before there were a lot of hydrometers to be able to be used uh like uh this this is the port right here this is the this is the condenser of the uh, prulo and the distal it comes down here and it goes down and then it comes fills up this well right here and then you can drop a hydrometer in there and a hydrometer is like a glass bobber it's it's calibrated and it's meant to float and as uh, as the alcohol decreases which means the the thickness of the distillate increases the hydrometer floats higher in the level and reports a lower proof but before before people had a lot of hydrometers to be able to be to use if you double distill something I like double distilled versus single distilled. And if you know the, uh, the distillers that double distilled without hydrometers, they noticed that the distillate coming out of the pipe, falling out of the pipe, out of the still at about 160 proof, the gravitational pull of the earth made it spin like a tight helix falling out of the, falling out of the pipe. And they saw that and they consistently would see that at around 160 proof or so. And so if it was double distilled and it was twisting super tight like that coming off the pipe, that was the D and T. And sure enough, sure enough, it was doing it. So I'm like, oh, I got to take a picture of that. So I, bam, I took a picture of the distillate coming off the pipe. I'm like, son of a bitch, that is the TNT right there. And that was my first label uh, for my first doubled and twisted. And uh, so that's that's the background with the term doubled and twisted. It's double distilled and it's the best part of the run. It's a real clean, high proof part of the run. It's very, very top note, flavorful aro uh, and aromatic at the same time. Uh, it's, a, it's a really neat part of the run. And so... That's we confer. Yeah, concur. <laughs> concur. <Yeah. laughs> Not Dang confer, it. we concur. I should have concurred. Yeah. And I have to say, like, you know, at the Crafty Cast, we've always, like, we, we get to drink amazing booze all the time. We're very fortunate that we get to try amazing craft drinks. And 
for years, we felt so guilty because we would constantly be at events like this and talking about our favorites and this and that. And we are so thrilled that now through Sip Scout, you guys get to drink what we drink and you guys get Very to try true. these things and we can point you to places where you can buy them online. So we're thrilled to help you drink as well as we do and try all these amazing craft products that you might not be able to get your hands on otherwise or know about otherwise. Very true. Um, let's move us along here so we can let everyone unmute themselves and start start chatting with you to the R5, which is also a really fun one. Um, tell us a little bit about R5. R5, well, TTB, uh, you know, we that, that was one of the first uh, hop flavored whiskeys, uh, bottle ready beer distillates. Uh, whiskeys that we started making uh, in 2010, 2011. And so TTB was like, well, I said, well, can I put Bear Republic on there? And can I put Racer 5? Because, you know, it's distilled from Racer 5. They're like, no, there's no commingling with breweries. You can't do that. Like, Fuck, are you kidding me? All right. Well, it's made from Racer 5. Can I put R5? They're like, yeah, you can do R5. I'm like, Great. Okay. So that's R5. It's uh, distilled from Racer 5 IPA, hops and all, CO2 and all. It's bottle ready beer. Uh, instead of going to the bottling line, they pump into a tanker truck, 6,400 gallons of Racer 5. And uh, I like to say that uh, I buy the biggest can that I can. It comes with a driver and 18 wheels. And uh, I get 6,400 gallons of it and I double distill it. Makes about 600 gallons of whiskey. And then the evaporation with the barrel aging happens. Uh, and back in those days when we started doing that, I was the distributor in California. And my mom and dad owned the license to the, for, the, for production, for, for distilling. Yeah. And so I started my own distribution business, Marco K Spirits. So I would buy my product from my mom and dad and I would sell it to stores and bars up and down California. And I wanted it stronger because that way you pour less of it and make a really intense cocktail. And, uh, you know, if you if you sell 100 proof as a distributor in California or in, in most uh, different states have different regulations and, and different taxes and stuff. But in, specifically in California, I got to pay double the state excise tax if I'm selling 100 proof. So if I'm selling 99 proof, I pay half the tax. Hello. OK, I'm going to bottle this in 99 proof, you know, because yeah. we all pay enough tax in our life. So no one's going to bitch about, you know, one proof. So it kind of stuck that uh, we sold the, uh, we kept making the R5 at uh, 99 proof. And so that's, that's where it is today. And we have, this one sold out. Um, and we have one more, which uh, I found some 2013 uh, R5 in the barrel. So it's going to be a 10 year barrel aged R5 final lot uh, on the label. And uh, that's getting bottled. Uh, we're bottling that on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday next week. Wow, that's so exciting! Ten years in the oh man. Yeah, we're gonna have to. <laughs> we're, we're gonna need to build a spirit cellar and start buying some cases of these things if it's the last one. <laughs> hey, put them away. I mean, that's what I did with the barrels. So I, I didn't even, you know, it's like we yeah. have it on inventory, but I haven't seen those barrels in years. I'm like, oh my god, look at that! I tried it one. Damn, this stuff is tasty. So. That's it's, the thing uh, about Charbet too, is they, they have patience and not a lot of distillers have as much patience as they do because, you know, the longer it's sitting there, you're not making any money on it and actually you're spending money on it. Um, and so their patience really pays off and makes for some delectable, super smooth, even at a high proof, you know, because for, for high proof, like this is very smooth, I think. I agree. Um, and if, you know, Marco does tend to bottle at a higher proof and you know sometimes people are like oh that's a little hot for me i don't know what to do with that the reason why that's a great idea like if people are selling you bottles at higher proof is because you can always proof down yourself but you can't proof it back up right so if you buy something at 99 proof and you prefer it to be a little bit you know you want it to round out the flavors add a couple of drops of water add an ice cube play with that add one drop of water at a time and keep tasting it to find where your specific sweet spot is and make it like custom and make it your own Right. And also cool. higher proof cocktails are, or higher proof spirits are great for cocktails. They show up a little bit yeah. better in cocktails, I think. Yeah. And as a perfect proof, you can, you can, you can flood it with soda water too. Just put it on the rocks and make a highball with it. I mean, it's sure. just delicious. As a perfect lead into the next one. I just oh. want to talk about the very limited opportunities that I've had to try aged spirits in any capacity that isn't 
scotch, basically. And particularly this this Blanco tequila, like the fact that this bottle is- Bottle-aged, you mean? I'm sorry, yes. Bottle-aged. Uh, yeah. This uh, bottle-aged white- That one too, I mean, that Blanco, one too. I have plenty of Blanco spirits, but yeah. bottle-aged Blanco in particular, and the way that the Blanco has softened oh, and yeah. like expanded over the years, but then just bottle age spirits in general, I think, are something that are kind of uncommon for people to have any kind of opportunity to try. And so get ready for the next one. This one is 40 years in the making, people. <laughs> We're moving on to the branding number 83. Oh, that that stuff's tasty. I mean, the, the 83, That's um, that was the first thing that we distilled with this Prulo still. And, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Obviously, I was 10. This is being told what to do by my dad, who mastered distiller. But I was I was with him, and we were making this. And the grapes, the variety is fully blanche. And fully blanche is like the classic super fine white grape grown in cognac, France, to make fantastic cognac with this still, but in cognac. And so these grapes were grown in Yauntville. It's a golf course now, uh, but uh, there was a there was a vineyard of Folle Blanche uh, just uh, west of the of Highway 29 in Yauntville, uh, right at Domaine Chandon. And um, so we got some of those grapes, and we made and we made 83 Folle Blanche brandy, and then we barrel aged it for 28 years. 28 years. Did 27, that? 27. In the barrel. Before it was even available. Years. I was like, Jesus, Dad, I think it's ready, you know? And uh, <laughs> so he didn't want to, he didn't want to sell any of it. And uh, I'm like, man, come on. We got a bottle. We got to bottle some of it. And uh, so 27 year ride in the barrel. And uh, as it opens up, I mean, more of that full blanche just comes out and uh, it's full bodied. Uh, you know, spirit's got to be full bodied to handle being barrel aged for that long. And uh, that is a that is a really, really, really fun, fun brandy. Yeah, I have to say the tequila and the brandy, whenever like we have really special people come over who really appreciate, we're like, okay you can have a little taste of this but we're very we're very protective of our brandy and our tequila over here <laughs> limited supply yeah marco i had the uh, opportunity to try uh a bacardi white rum which you know i say yeah. that and i feel like pretty much everybody on this call is probably like had a bacardi white rum before the who the hell cares but it was a bacardi white rum that was distilled in 1971. There you go. And it was distilled by Ron Bacardi. <laughs> and I was like, but still it's like Bacardi. And you then I was it. like, oh, holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. This is white rum, but then it's also like all these things that happen over 50 years as it sits there and keeps doing what stuff does. Traveling and through time like everybody else completely yeah. blew my mind it was unbelievable and this is the same like i could i could hang out with my nose in this dram for a very long Not time the, the smell of this it almost it almost reminds me a little bit of an agricole rum like because it has that like real earthy funky kind of like yeah mm. it's just beautiful but and you know a lot of people aren't sure what to do with brandy you know a lot of people and unintentionally have bottle aged brandy on there because they bought a bottle of brandy and they forgot about it but honestly I we said brandy like whiskey I mean it's a beautiful after dinner drink um if you like cigars it's wonderful with cigars with some cheese it's wonderful um so it's it's just really quite special and just mm. beautiful for sipping yeah this one uh you know we, we diluted this one down to 80 40 percent so it was just like a classic you know just classic concept of of a a, a real barrel aged spirit and uh i like it at i like it at 80 proof we uh we also you know if you like brandies we have another brandy that we distilled in 89 
and we barrel aged that one for 24 years and we diluted that down to 92 proof it's a little higher proof and uh that uh those two those two side by side are just just mm. so different but uh you know the same same uh same pulse and same you know same still same distill or same concept of uh you know what we do but uh you know showing one at 80 proof and another one at 92 proof it's uh it's a really neat contrast yeah lovely all right well i want to let everyone unmute themselves and have some time to jump in with our last half hour here that we have together but first can we all raise raise a glass and do a little a little cheers to charbet and their 40 years i'm raising the tequila and Viva. happy anniversary marco yeah uh, happy we're delighted to be a part of this wonderful celebration of your journey and your family's journey. This is really just a remarkable portfolio that you are helping to culminate and move to the next level. Yeah, and thank you for sharing these delicious spirits with us, especially the special ones that, you know, took a little doing to get to everyone here. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone, feel free. Go ahead and mute yourselves. Um, we'll kind of we might mute we might mute you again if like there's background noise or things like that. But that doesn't mean we don't want you to unmute yourself again and get your question in there. So go ahead and start ch chatting with Marco and us well, if you well, like. Thank Steve's you. Up. Steve's up. Go ahead, guys. Oh, thank you. I, I I haven't tried the brandy yet. I'm still on the double twisted. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Favorite story ever from a distiller. Uh, like I know a lot of the stories from the distiller, but no, that was really wonderful. That it's, that's kind of like your uh, kind of adolescent adventure into into brewer into distillery yeah. or fame, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I even had a badass name for my brewery. I was like, I was in high school, I was like I want to start a brewery. My mom's like, you're not <laughs> going to start a brewery. We have a distillery. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, no. yeah. Right. Marco. Yes, sir. Hi, we're uh, a, a major group from Iowa. <laughs> hey. Uh, hey, look hey. at the party. Thanks for oh, doing it. Wow. That looks like a good time. We have been to uh, your original facility up on top of the mountain twice. And I think our first visit was in the early 2000s or late 1990s. Yeah. But <laughs> we loved the uh, walnut brandy that you did. Oh, yeah. And here and yeah. and personally i love the grappas oh yeah and you don't make either of those anymore well uh i did uh i i did make uh black walnut uh i picked black walnuts last year out of calusa from a double a walnut ranch there like a great organic walnut orchard and made a made an extract so for for the 40th year anniversary of this year we are uh, we are launching uh, Black Walnut Liqueur again. Woo! Yeah. I, I would like to personally say you guys are incredible. Aww. I mean, it's just we have we have enjoyed all your products for so many years, and yeah. uh, congratulations! I mean, what a what an awesome uh, track record you guys have. They yeah. really are one of the best yeah. of the best. We're still a yeah. team of five people here at Charvet, Rich. It's crazy. You know, yeah. can we come work for you? <laughs> yeah, come on over. <laughs> I'm recording. I have nothing else to do. Hey. <laughs> oh, sweet. So the next time you get your hands on the black walnut liqueur, mix it with equal parts of uh, rainwater, Madeira, and espresso. That's his oh. favorite mm. thing. It's one of his favorite cocktails. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You know, the thing that got the rise here was the espresso. I think we're all just kind of now kind of giddy with excitement. Yeah, what do you do with an espresso liqueur when you have that? Yeah, maybe. I mean, that might be a little bit high proof. <laughs> I feel like the espresso is meant to temper yeah. the alcohol, but who knows? You know, you, you eat your own. Oh, it's, it's for a lot of people. I used to do a lot of cocaine, Evan. They're not doing a lot of cocaine. There's <laughs> a speedball for you. Still oh. want to do something, you know, and uh, here's some here's some espresso liqueur, man. <laughs> and, and just for just for clarification, you still have the facility on the mountain in between Napa and yes, Sonoma, sir. correct? Yeah, that's and, on the mountain. And the last time we were out, 
you we were told you had a facility in Ukiah where you had more that's barrels right. stored. That's where that's he is where right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. Two different spots. Right now, I'm in, I'm in the distillery in Ukiah, Mendocino County. It's like an hour north of uh, of St. Helena. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, and then the where you where you came up on Spring Mountain, that's our winery and and brandy distillery. That's where I grew up. That's where my mom and dad lived. Mm. Yeah, we love that because we went up oh. there for a grappa tasting one time and, and they poured the sample. They said, you can't drink this, but we're going to leave the room so you can smell it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, you just did a lot of smelling there, didn't you? Right. you smelled a lot of things there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations. So what a what a what an achievement. You guys are great. Thank you. Uh, you know, hey, uh, uh, Rich, if you guys come out to California, uh, you know, look us up, give me a call or something and, and come check out the distillery up in Ukiah. It's uh, like two hours north of San Francisco. Yeah. 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 Well, the travel. It sure is. And I see you're unmuted there. Did you have a question? No, just joining the conversation. But uh, I am planning on going up to uh, Ukiah next month. So uh, Marco, absolutely want to check out the distillery. And then this is the the first I'm hearing, or at least maybe I forgot. But uh, I live in uh, Windsor uh, and work in Healdsburg, so that that's where I'm at. Right but uh, so uh, yeah, this uh, this location between Napa and Sonoma is that open for for visitors? No, my mom and dad have been retired, and uh, you know uh, Jenny and I, you know, we're running Charbet Distillery. And the winery is, uh, you know, it's still uh, operational. We make a little bit of wine, uh, but uh, we're, not, we're not doing tours and tastings as, anymore right there. Uh, the goal, uh, the plan is uh, for Jenny and our two boys and, uh, and myself to move back to Spring Mountain. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once we're there, then we'll be able to, you know, be able to do tastings and, and uh, make some, some fun products again. Uh, in the winery, but there's only so much we can do. And right now, I'm just focusing on on distilled spirits. Right now, uh, putting this putting this new still in, and so um, yeah, we're not. Unfortunately, we're just we're not doing any tastings anymore up there. And Marco, correct me if I'm wrong, but technically, you don't do tastings and tours at the distillery either. Like if it's a friendly and they reach out to you, like, but like there's not, you can't go online and book something or anything like that. Yeah, we, we don't have any signs up. Uh, we don't, uh, we don't have a tasting room. Uh, we, we can't, the, one of, and one of the, the reasons is we can't sell retail direct. Um, and it's a California law and we're just kind of not in the, you know, we're not the, even though we're, only five people and when we started Charvet there were three micro distilleries in the whole U.S. and we were one of them uh, we're not considered craft because we import tequila tapatio so we don't qualify and stuff so we can't mm -hmm. sell our 2.25 bottles a day uh, retail direct unfortunately so we, we don't have a tasting room and um, so it's just it's just like if people call and we have some time uh, you know I can I can show you the distillery. They do also okay. have a lot of great videos, and I, I say that we, we shot the videos, so <laughs> great videos um, on YouTube that actually kind of walk you through the distillery, show you some of the processes, like interviews with Miles and Marco together and the whole family. So they have a lot of great YouTube content that kind of like transports you there and helps you like hear more of their stories. So go, go check out their YouTube channel as well. Yeah, I wish we had a visitor center and I wish we could sell retail direct. That would be... Uh... That would be a lovely thing to be able to sell your own product to someone who wants to buy your product. <laughs> Just I mean, not what a crazy, what a crazy idea, Marco. What a weird, what a weird idea to want to be able to sell the thing you're making to people directly. <laughs> Thank you. Twenty First Amendment. Yeah. And yeah. speaking of, I know people are getting a little antsy. People wanna. People are asking in the chat, "How do we order? How do we order? How do we order? Where's the link? Where's the link?" So I'm gonna throw the link in the chat where you can go order some of these like few bottles that are left online. I will say. When you go to this link, they're pretty much all right at the top there, except for the Doubled and Twisted, because we've had that on our site oh, forever. Right. So you just need to search Doubled and Twisted, and you'll find it. It is on there. Um, but everything else will kind of be right there. Hey, Marco, while she's putting that in the chat, yeah. um, just future looking to the, you know, 
return to Spring Mountain, is uh, winemaking potentially going to be part of, I mean, I know you said that oh, there's yeah. a small amount of that that is still being made. I, I had the opportunity to try, I found a half bottle. Um, oh, yeah. A late mm. harvest. Oh. Uh. From like 2010, <laughs> like 10 years ago. Well, I guess that's not even possible because. Oh, well, that that late harvest that was actually. So you uh, went to thirty years ago. Eighty-three yeah. late yeah. harvest. Yeah. Fully yeah. Blanc that we that we close to thirty. and then dosaged and corked again so that the the yeast ate the sugar some more and slightly carbonated that late harvest fully botched size Sauvignon Blanc and gave it a little spritz uh, effervescence to it. And God damn, that stuff was so good. That was a total yeah. complete freak of nature right there. I was curious if that was intentional or like, like just a miracle of, anyway. It was kind of a miracle and a freak of nature yeah. all kind of come together. Let's uh, let's see what we can really do with this freak of nature and get really freaky with it. And uh, it uh, it turns into like a sizzling, sizzling, crisp, uh, uh, fully botchesized late harvest Sauvignon Blanc. So not something that's going to be readily be able to like recreate it. No, I mean, 83 was one of those rainy years uh, that, uh, you know, it rained in, in August, uh, which was right when you're starting to pick uh, white grapes, uh, August, uh, it's right in there. And yeah, that botricized element of it is going to be absent most years. I remember I was, I had a three wheeler and uh, we're on McNabb Ranch and uh, I was, uh, I was ripping it out through the vineyards and I'm looking at these gondolas of, uh, of, of Sauvignon Blanc coming into the winery that my dad was working at. And uh, in 82, 83, and uh, I was like, what, 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 what is wrong this? with these grapes? You know, it's just like, these grapes are moldy, man. Are you, what are you doing with these? Like, it's okay. It's botrytis. It's amazing. It's, you know, it's going to be great. I'm like, okay. But God damn, they look nasty. But uh, it turned out to be something just completely delicious. But yeah, you know, I like I like making red wine. Uh, we still have some. We have a little bit of 2013 Napa Valley Cab left, and uh, and we have ports from 06 that are just awesome. And we still have um, we still have barrels of ports that are from 06 that are still barrel aging away. Oh as well. wow! So yeah, once we get back to once we get back to making wines uh, more consistently. Uh, then, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to be launching some of those. And once I, you know, the fun thing about that is I, lo I love, I love barrel aging in port barrels, uh, different spirits, rums, uh, rums and whiskeys work great, uh, in port barrel. So we'll be able to pull the barrel, we'll pull our port and then, uh, put, uh, put something into those port barrels and, and let it go as well. So. That. That's really cool. You know, it's funny is that you were talking a little bit about trying to encourage your dad to release the 83. Uh, yeah. Hey, sell some 83. Maybe in a few years, your kids will be encouraging you to release the 06 port. I'm like, yeah. come on, just sell it. Just release it. What's the big deal? Who knows? Yeah, you know, uh, it's coming up on, uh, yeah. it's, it's coming up on 20 years, barrel aged, you know, yeah. so yeah, for sure. Be good. Hey, hey Marco, that. Marco, I got one bottle of green tea aperitif left. That's right. Oh. Yeah, so, you know, that that old aperitif deal, we came up with that because it was like, what, you know, what what distilled spirits are, are, are we selling a lot of? And people are, you know, people are loving the green tea but we can't sell it retail direct. This is when Jenny and I were still living up on Spring Mountain and we had the winery open. I'm like, well, let's make aperitifs. You know, those are fortified wines. And uh, we made an aperitif with, and we made a green tea aperitif and, and there it is. Oh, it's absolutely fantastic with lemonade. Yeah. Best drink you could ever have. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, I haven't seen those for a long time. So a lot of- Yeah, I, mean, we, I, prefer, I don't wanna- I, Went to just finished a bottle recently. I have one left. I was waiting to see if you were making more before I broke that one open. Oh man! Well, we 
we made we uh we made some uh, pomegranate a pair of teeth as well um uh, that uh we uh you know that that's something that we would totally make again once we get back to the winery i just uh, i'm i'm just maxed out you know we do uh we do contract bottling uh we do some private labeling of our products and this whole still right here uh this whole big still here um the story behind the whole reason we're getting that is I have a customer who really believes in us and wants to ramp up production. They want to do, they want to do like 600 barrels. And so I did the math. I'm like, well, you know, with this still, uh, I'll be done with 600 barrels in about four years. <laughs> so, you know, it's time to get a different still. We need another still to start feeding it. And they're like, okay, just tell us what you need. So, <laughs> So uh, we've got it. We've got uh, sponsored, and we got the we got this still up and running. As soon as we get it up and running, we're going to be off to the races and, and banging away with that. So, got our hands full right now. But that's the beauty of having a winery is we don't necessarily have to make Chardonnay and Cabernet. Uh, we can do all the all the fun different things that we you know that we like to do as well. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I like making Cab Franc. And uh, we made a little bit of white wines as well, uh, but so I mean we gotta we gotta make some red wine. But there's I mean there's just so many different amazing products that we can make. It's gonna be it's gonna be cool. I'm looking forward to it. Poor Marco has everyone in his ear like make this again, make more of this, make this again. I know Jenny's always oh there's Jenny. Jenny's joining us. She's always saying pastis, make more pastis. Make more pastis, Marco. <laughs> oh my god. Well, the pastis is important to make because it, it was amazing. We have a lot of trees and a lot of grass uh, here in Northern California and it's pollen season right now. As you can see, like yellow clouds of pollen, like going through, going through like a big monster cloud. And, uh, you know, it catches up with you sometimes. And this one time, uh, Jenny was, you know, feeling the effects of all that pollen and we we had some pastis i'm like well here why don't you just have a glass of pastis you know let's see what happens and i mean it's yeah. stopped, it stopped you know the 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 pollen uh, sinus attack uh, and it uh, it was like I don't know. tried it again like a like a couple hours later and you know it totally worked it's amazing so we do need to make more pastis I love that story, but I don't think that's why Jenny's asking you to make more pasta. She's asking you to make more because it's delicious. I know. I know. It's, a good ex it's a good excuse to make it, but yeah, you got it. Yeah. You know. But that was another one where you guys were kind of ahead of your time because you made it. Didn't you make it because your mother really loved it and your mother wanted yeah. kind of a pastis since your dad kind of made it for her? Yeah, my dad's like, that's it. We're just going to make it. There's no good pastis on the planet. Let's just make our own. I'm like, okay, yeah. dad, let's do that. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, Jenny. Hey. Hi. Uh, this, this, I'm, uh, I'm Mark and Janet, uh, I don't know if you can Jess, she visited the Still on the Hill about 30 years ago. Hey, Mark, I remember you yeah. guys. 20 yeah. years ago, you met me. And, yeah. we, we've, and we've got uh, um, two sellers, one here in New York and one in Hawaii. And um, small story you know the the uh, guy who delivers us the wine in hawaii uh there was a false nuclear attack on hawaii and there was a there was a um uh an alert that there might be a missile going to hawaii which didn't turn out to be the case from north korea um but the guy who delivers the wine to us there got yeah. in his truck and headed for our farm and he knew exactly where he wanted to shelter in place. Your cellar. <laughs> among, uh, that's it. Among the Charbets. And we have everyone you mentioned. Because <laughs> we get the mixed cases and we have some of the old ones. If you run out, you can always tap us. Oh. We, we have them both here and, in, and uh, here. We're in New York now and or in our farm in Hawaii. And I even asked your advice one time. Um, since we're we're coffee producers, among other oh. um, hundred other things, and we have the Kono Arabicas, and and you know they were always interested, interesting, and uh, we had we come from sugarcane country too, and I tried my hand at uh, 
distilling. Uh, and I got to the point of um, fire water. You know, I, I got the aqua vita, you know, 90, 90 odd percent. And then I was attacked by the uh, food and drug and alcohol and firearms. And they asked me how many trucks I have and what were, you know, this was a, supposed to be a hobby. And uh, my floor plans and uh, my tax situation. Um, so that they like a, to know who's they like to know who's running the stills. Put it put a damper on it. Um, we <laughs> we were tempted, we were tempted with um, uh, marijuana, uh, which is uh, another interesting product. Um, Alcohol we, soluble. Well, um, or the marriage. And uh, I'm sure that people are, are, are combining the two. Sure. Uh, I have a background in science and, uh, and, uh, and healing. <laughs> uh, we do some interesting other stuff. But um, anyways, we enjoy the Charbet. We, we definitely enjoy the Charbet for, for 30 years. 30 I gotta, years. I got to yeah. say, we all want a shelter in place in your cellar, too. <laughs> Either one, you know, one, one in New York and one in Hawaii. We go oh, kind right. of. So, so, I like the Hawaii one. <laughs> well, you miss out. You miss out on some some other good stuff in New York too. New York. I mean, I love New York, but if I'm sheltering in place, right? Yeah. Hey. You you gotta, gotta, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I was there during that that missile scare, and uh, it was terrifying. Yeah. And I would have gone to your cellar if I'd have known. So. <laughs> Let's exchange island. information after this, uh, yes. just in case it happens again. Oh, man. All right. That's beautiful. I want to check that out. <laughs> other <sighs> questions? I see a couple other people unmuted, but I don't want to necessarily. Carla, Peter, anyone? No? No. no. Going once. Go I just wanted to say that I, I just love, we just love your stuff over here. So we got this uh, yeah. at the, when we went to Napa Valley in 2010. And then we actually got engaged on that trip. My husband's eating chips right now, but hey. he is here too. <laughs> so that's oh, lovely, wow. Rachel. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. And I also want the Tunisian, to, Tahitian vanilla bean rum back. Oh, <laughs> I like my. all the other stuff too, but. That was good. Yeah, we. Uh, it looks like you've got an old bottle there as well. Where? Yeah, look at oh, that. There's the Tahitian vanilla. Vanilla rum. There you go. Oh man! All right, uh, we got to figure that one out. <laughs> We're just gonna keep leaning on him until he, request, until he submits, right? Yeah, I love it. I, I totally <laughs> appreciate. Absolutely appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I know what I got to do. Now. I got to make some pastis. I got to make some vanilla, tisha, vanilla bean rum. You got to find some cane sugar. Yeah. Got to find, got to find another island with some maple uh, cane syrup, not molasses. That's because uh, that's that was the key with that Tahitian vanilla bean rum is we we distilled uh, Maui sugar cane syrup from C and H, not the molasses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We do we do the syrup. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the only way to go. I mean, it shows off. It shows off the terroir of where that cane's grown, big time. So, so I don't know if you'd want this sort of terroir necessarily. I don't know, but um, I know there is a distiller. Do you know Brighton Brown down in Oakland? Uh, they're make, they're making rum with sugar cane grown down near Fresno, I believe. There's a, fa a Filipino family out there who is actually growing sugar cane, and so he's working with them to get sugar cane and has played a little. Yeah, played a little bit even with making like an agricole style with their sugar cane. Um, so that could be interesting looking into a California rum. Yeah, but I like going to Maui. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm, in, I'm in your camp. I would no do joke. Thing. Let me find a tropical island where I have to go source my materials, please. How come there are no tropical versus, islands versus closer? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. We can get there. We'll get there. No. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, is there, uh, is there an ingredient that you've worked with that you loved and you made something really tasty with but you'll never work with again because it was just too difficult to work with great question um well black mission figs oh we uh we harvested black mission figs 
and uh, fermented those and uh, did the best we could to separate or rack off the the Black Mission fig wine from the from the uh, the, the 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 must the pumice, uh, so to speak, of the uh, of the Black Mission figs, and it was an absolute nightmare. Uh, but we we got it separated, and then we double distilled it in the small still, and drinking, uh, tasting 136 proof Black Mission Fig O to V. It's just absolutely fantastic. I'm sure. But to do it commercially would, uh, you know, I would definitely want to have some help uh, making that again. But uh, yeah, that was that comes to mind. That sounds. <laughs> Absolutely fascinating. And just to clarify, Marco, um, was it primarily the removal of the solid material from the liquid the part? that was challenging? Stickiness or There's so many pectins and uh, all the little seeds and, uh, you know, it's oh, just yeah. a mission fig, you know, by itself. It's just, uh, you know, it's, have you ever made juice out of black mission figs? I can't uh, imagine, but I now, as soon as you said the size of the seeds, I was like, there is no filter that can allow liquid to pass through that that would also stop the seeds from going in there. Yeah. 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 Not, uh, not fun, but uh, we did it. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's something that uh, I think we still have. No, actually, you know what? Uh, I think we lost that in the fire, actually. Oh. Uh, when the fires whip, ripped through uh, Napa Valley a couple of years ago, uh, our property got hit a little bit. Uh, the building, the winery was intact, uh, pretty much intact. Uh, Mom and Dad's house was intact, uh, and, but uh, you know we had a we had another structure that uh, took a beating, and um, we had uh, we lost a lot of uh, a lot of trophies, a lot of a lot of things that we had stored away that uh, you know weren't expecting a uh, a mountain raging fire to rip through at 12,000 miles an hour at 12,000 degrees but uh, yeah but that that's one of them uh, what else uh, that that was that was probably the most difficult if you don't have the right technology to do something man it just really sucks and uh, yeah. it's not it's just not easy but, what about new things you're looking forward to? Are there any little sneak peeks or previews of things that you're playing around with, even if maybe they don't fully come to fruition that you can get us excited about? Well, different whiskeys for sure. Um, like uh, focusing more on some California single malts and some rye. Um, and then, uh, you know, we did mention the, uh, the Pachanga sunflower root distillate that we did a while back. I think it, you know, it was just way, it was just too hard to explain to everybody what you do with this. And that was before craft cocktailing really, you know, kicked in. Yeah. And so now I think more than ever, um, you know, everybody's trying to do something different and, and it seems like a lot of people are using different barrels to make something different, but you know, it's still the same, but it's a different barrel. Uh, but, uh, you know, using a different source of, uh, distilling material, um, I think, uh, you know, we were the first ones to do it on the planet and probably, probably time to bring it back. So, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna take a trip to, uh, to, uh, Sunchoke country and uh you know establish a relationship with a grower again and uh you know get those get those tubers uh harvested and uh and get going with it because it's it's a it's a it's a wild spirit it's purely north american it's indigenous to north america um and uh you know it's uh you can get 30 tons an acre with no real uh no real um pests so uh, sustainability. Exciting. I didn't know you were thinking about bringing that back because that's always been on my top list because I love savory cocktails and like things that are a little bit more savory in note. And so the idea of a sun choke liqueur, it sounds fascinating. Yeah. Right? And just, just to kind of clarify that a little bit, if you would apply mm -hmm. this, Marco, did you say pachanga? Yeah. You know, because we, you know, we like making tequila and we let, you know, and it was just like, what's something that's similar uh, in, in structure? to to that and it was the tuber and so we uh my dad wanted to give it a a good mexican spanish name 
and uh, we named it Pachanga, which is like a like a three day party sometimes. Uh, sometimes. <laughs> oh, okay. So I was hearing Pachuga, which is like that well, version of the. Yeah. You, you, I'm sure you're familiar with Pachuga, and I, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> What am I missing here? You gonna be hanging some chicken breasts in the distillery? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, 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 thanks. Not anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it's cool, uh, but uh, it's just uh, it's not my style. That's for sure. Um, Insane. We would probably change the name too, and uh, you know, showcase Northern California and showcase showcase North America, uh, and uh, really, you know, give it the the the, the treatment that uh, that it probably would really deserve and appreciate. Well, that sounds very exciting. Well, Marco, anything you're making, we're trying and we're we're likely by, by history. Like, I don't think there's been a single thing I've tried of theirs that I haven't liked. So <laughs> all right, try all. away, experiment away, and we will all be your guinea pigs. And I'm sure the crew here, it seems like all agree. Yeah, we got some thumbs up from people. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We are at the end of our session here. Holy cow. Time flies when you're having fun, I know. Um, Evan and I are always happy to stick around for a little while and chit chat with people if they'd like to. I know Marco has his family to probably get home to or things to distill perhaps, but uh, um, we'll stick around for a little while. Thank you everyone for joining. If you loved what you did here with us today, we do this every month with different craft alcohol. Join Sip Scout. We would love to have you as members. Continue to support Charbet. I hope you got some of those bottles that are on sale there. Um, and Marco, happy 40th anniversary. Thank you so much for celebrating with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sin. Thank you. That was awesome. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers, Marco. And everybody, hey, thank you for joining. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks Marco, for, thank you, man. Thank you. Thanks, for, uh, thanks for reminding me of the good times when you came yeah. up. And I really appreciate it 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I mean, wow, that's... Uh, that's a long, that was a ride, you know. Um, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's our pleasure to have you here, and I hope that we can see you again for your next anniversary celebration, Marco. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. All yeah, right. <laughs> or we'll come up to Ukiah. Or we'll be in Ukiah, yeah. <laughs> we'll come party with you guys in Ukiah. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll be following some of this pretty soon. Uh, it's, it's, our, it's our espresso, The Cure. And... Uh, that's like the newest thing that's going to be coming out soon. And uh, it's going to be fun. I'm oh, be... so excited about that. I'm so excited about that. Yeah, I'm very excited because espresso liqueurs are great, but there's a lot of like kind of one kind of espresso liqueurs versions. that are just like kind of boring. Like St. George is probably one of my favorites out there. You know, there are no one on the core with a little bit of chicory in it. Um, so I'm excited to see what what yours tastes like and what your your kind of approach to it is. It's going to be going to be fun. Mm -hmm. well, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I like it. It's going to be fun. <laughs> right on. Well, have a great evening. Thanks again, Suzanne Evans. Thank you. Everybody else, appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, Margo. Have a, have a great Thanks. evening, Marco. Yeah. Tell Jenny you said hi. Give her a hug for us. Oh, I will. I will. I'm just now, I'm just waiting for, uh, I have uh, one more part. I've got uh, this still that needs to go over here. Cause that's the tallest part of the building so it's going to go right next to that and then uh once we get that set up then uh we're going to be off to the races with that because i've got like fourteen thousand gallons of beer that i need to distill so it's time wow so, yeah. cool well, so this is where i'm going to be <laughs> <laughs> i hope your cot is comfortable <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah bye I do have a single uh, size bed over there, which is very nice. <laughs> yeah. no, we've seen it. We know. I was like, wait, is this a cot? Who's sleeping here? And Jenny's like, Marco. <laughs> oh, I mean, in 2019, I slept in here, uh, I think, 182 nights. Whoa. And oh, my God. I double distilled over 120,000 gallons of, of beer. I made some brandy that year, too, myself. And um, I just, uh, I won't do that again. I just uh, can't. Yeah, I mean, that says something for your passion, but, you know, work-life balance, man, work-life balance. <laughs> was, um, you know, I mean, you get into, you get into seven, eight, nine, ten days in a row, and uh, you're sleeping like maybe four hours a day, at, you know, at all, you know, it doesn't, it's not normal hours, and, uh, 
you know, your, your dreams start turning really, really vivid. And uh, it's, uh, <laughs> at least they don't turn gray. I feel like that would be maybe worse. Like no. you're sleeping and then the dreams are all gray. You're like, well, what am I doing this for? At least my dreams are like alive, even <laughs> if I feel like I'm doing a drudgery day to day. I mean, I'd, I'd tell you why. I mean, it was, uh, <laughs> it was like four in the morning or something or whatever. And uh, I was, uh, I knew I had like two hours to take a nap real quick. And uh, all of a sudden I'm, I'm in this tunnel and uh, smuggling weed with this Mexican family into Mexico. And I'm in this tunnel and there's a checkout counter and it's all going this way, like on a, on a belt drive. And this guy's like, $5,000 a pound. I'm like, that's what we get up here. <laughs> he's like, unbelievable. I, I know, it's totally unbelievable. And the doors are playing, like echoing through the background. <laughs> this is the end. Totally bizarre. And uh, then... Clint Eastwood's right there, and he's like, you want to smoke a cigar? I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I'd love to smoke a cigar. Thank you. And I don't have a cutter. He's like, just bite the tip off of it. I'm like, all right, I'm going to bite the tip off of it. So I'm smoking a cigar with Clint Eastwood, and then I get through these doors, and it's this crazy little beach. And, uh, and then I've got this blue Weber grill. You know how the front post always falls out of the Weber grill when you go to move it and stuff? I'm, I'm cleaning this thing like to put it on a truck and somebody says something behind me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And they're like, oh, $400. I'm like, what? It's like, now I'm in a live auction for my blue grill that I'm trying to clean to get in the truck. And this is my $800, bitches. No one's going to be taking my grill. And uh, so I won, I won my grill and I'm putting it, uh, I'm putting it up on the truck and the leg falls off of it. And these got these gold coins start falling out of the grill. Like a slot machine it's like, ting, 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 ting. I'm like, see, this is why I paid $800 for my grill. This is exactly why you know, the gold coins are falling out of the grill and you're coming out. It's great. And I woke up and I'm like, what the, what the, what? And it's like, I just like, I just gotta, I gotta get up. And uh, I got to check the still and uh, everything is fine. But uh, man, that was just, it was just, uh, it gets to you once in a while. <laughs> there you go, friends. Dreams of a distiller. Like, is that, do you get any more of a behind the scenes inside scoop than that? That's an amazing dream, Marco. And I love oh. that you like remember it in such like vivid detail. Oh, um, it was. I'm glad crazy. that it wasn't a premonition of things to come. It really was just like you went back to the still and everything's hunky dory. Yeah. yeah. I was like, okay, but, you know, back to reality. It's like, this is great. This is great. <laughs> I'm okay. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Nuts. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully you have more fun dreams and they, they keep you in. Yeah. <laughs> So, all righty. Well, I'm going to get going. Thanks again, Suzanne. Evans, right. Thank you. Everybody else. Thank you so much for uh, sticking around. Uh, thanks for getting that bottle of uh, green tea mm -hmm. and out. And, uh, you know, yeah, thank you everybody who came up to the winery to see us like 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Maybe you got some Cab Franc in your cellar still. Um, I just tried some like, like two years ago and or yeah like oh, a year ago and yeah it was it was tasty i'd love to make some more of that and i know what i gotta make now i gotta make more pasties and i gotta bring that to each and it'll be in run back so yeah uh, your march more that's the rumor putting you to work but i'm excited to try more wine from spring mountain too <laughs> yeah well those grapes i buy we don't own any vineyards i buy grapes from friends vineyards uh, around napa valley so the the 13 was uh from um uh, just uh, south of Stag's Leap District, uh, towards American Canyon, on the, uh, the you know like the east southeast side of the valley, higher side of the valley, and then uh, the Cab Franc came from uh, St. Helena, and then uh, we've got some Cab from uh, from Stag's Leap, and we made Syrah from uh, Lake County a couple of years, like 06 and 07, and some of that. So just uh, 
just utilizing friends and uh, you know getting a couple tons here and there and this and that. I mean, I mean we only make like 10, 15 barrels of wine at a time, you know, when we do. Sure. So, you know, just enough to make a mess. And uh, <laughs> just to make just to make you a little bit anxious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's fun. You know, we just go old school style. You know, I use one ton bins and a uh, one ton basket press and uh, do punch downs like three times, you know, every eight hours. And uh, just, uh, you know, just showcase the grapes. You know, they are what they are. So that's what uh, that's what we're going to make wines with and uh, barely, you know, barely filter it and uh, uh, mess with uh, did uh, egg white fining once or twice. That's uh -oh. fun. And uh, yeah, it's fun. I like making red wine. Well, when you're ready to do that, if you need an extra pair of hands, just tap Evan and he'll come come up and help you for a few days. I'll like, come try to He would love that. Out. He would love that. Right. <laughs> yeah. That'd yeah. be great. Yeah. All right. Be well, fun. thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thanks for having me. Have a great evening, Marco. Thank Happy you. Thank you. Bye, Marco. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>